Tô, não dá pra... So, so now let's try for the amplification. Is the speaker on? We try for the amplification. This is a, this is a test. This is a test. We're pretty close together. So, Bilal, you can help me. Yes. Yes. So this is continues to be a test to a test. This is a test. Oh ho. Yeah, but it's, um, but it, Pilar, is it good back there? Can you hear me quite clearly? So isn't it better to have the microphone where people, farther away from me, because people here can hear with no amplification? They're going right now, but we want to make sure that the people who are furthest from me can hear. So Pilar said, not so clear, yes? I can hear very well. You can hear very well. I can hear very well. <laughs> Okay, so it's 4.35. So Raviji, are we ready to begin? Yes. Oh, that's all good. good. So let's spend just a couple of minutes, just quietly. You may just follow the in and out breath as the Lord Buddha taught. So just quietly, I'll give a bit of guidance and then we'll go to the teaching. So let's sit, simply qu sit quietly, make the mind serviceable, with mindfulness of breathing. Very good, very effective method. For those who wish to enter the path of the Buddha, to follow the Buddha Dharma, the gateway is placing our trust, our confidence in the Buddha himself, in his teachings, the Dharma, in the community of great adepts who have realized the fruit of the path, the Sangha. We entrust our very well-being to the three jewels in this lifetime that we may find the Dharma, find genuine happiness in this lifetime, but this isn't enough. This life may be over at any time. So what can we do to ensure that we can, can maintain the continuity of practice from this lifetime and on into future lifetimes? For this we entrust ourselves to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. But to find liberation, which after all is the, the central point of the Buddhist teachings, we must entrust ourselves to a person who has found liberation, realized liberation, and who is effective in leading others to this fruition. So for our freedom, for our freedom from samsara, we take refuge. And to enter the great vehicle, the Mahayana, Follow the, all, the path of all the bodhisattvas of the past, the present, and the future. We develop bodhicitta, at the same time taking refuge in the Buddha to lead us to perfect awakening of a Buddha. And who else could possibly do that but one who has achieved perfect awakening, him or herself? 
So we begin with refuge in bodhicitta. We bring this preparation to a culmination, as Geshe La taught us this morning, by arousing the aspiration and beyond the aspiration a resolve, a commitment, a determination to achieve the perfect awakening of a Buddha for the benefit of all beings, to liberate all beings from suffering and its causes. And with this motivation, we listen to the teachings and we resolve to put them into practice. So I've been asked this afternoon to give some introduction to one of the most revered and loved and practiced and taught teachings in all of Tibetan Buddhism. And it was by one of the greatest of the Indian pundits throughout all of Indian history, who was known for his exceptional kindness to the people of Tibet, and this is Jo Atisha, Deepam Garasit Jnana. And we were at his home monastery just a couple of days ago, but we were there a very short time, and the sun was going down, so we had planned for me to discuss his quintessential teaching there. There was no time, so now we come to the place of the Buddha himself, his enlightenment. And so to focus on the seven-point mind training, the Lojong Dunduma is called in Tibetan. As Geshe Lao commented, I think, a day or two ago, that a teacher is especially well-known and revered by all schools of Tibetan Buddhism. The Nyingmapas who were already there before he came, and then the new translation schools, the Kaikyu, the Sakya, the Gelukpa, all of them revered Atisha. No sectarianism there. Maybe, I speculate, maybe one reason, no politics. In Tibet there was a lot of power, there was Dharma together with power. It's true, it happens, and it's not bad. But it always creates a rivalry. Wherever there's power, then people want and it creates some competitiveness, yes? It's always true. Whatever religion, whatever path, also for philosophy. But Atisha and his great disciples, these great Kadampa Geshes, they were known for just simply being simple Buddhist monks, simple Buddhist practitioners. And in fact, his principal disciple, Dom Dumba, wasn't a monk. He was a layperson, never became monk. And he's regarded as one of the earlier incarnations of His Holiness Dalai Lama, Dom Dumba. So Atisha, he really stirs my heart with faith. I've studied his life, his teachings, and the teachings he's most well known for, which he formulated, it was something un unprecedented, is what we nowadays call the lam, Lamrim, the stages of the path. In the Sakya tradition, they call it Lamde, same, same, same format. In the Kagyu tradition, the jewel ornament of liberation, Tapataigen, that's their Lamrim. In the Nyingma tradition, words of my perfect teacher, it's Lamrim. So it's all schools, without any sectarianism at all, but the basic format, the structure of this path, as set forth by Joatisha, as Geshe Ra said a couple of days ago, it's in these three scopes, these three approaches to Dharma. And the first one, when you really see what's the big picture, it's not just finding happiness in this lifetime. Death can come at any time. That's true for all of us. And in a way it would be relief if the materialists were right. In a way, because then you know, okay, then all my problems, all my problems are finished. If I can just be terminated, death, okay, then this is like a poker game with very low stakes, <laughs> and you can walk away from the game any time you like, and then you're finished, no problem. So in a way, that's quite appealing. I see why so many people like to believe that, because then all your problems finished, whatever they were, all finished. Unfortunately, it's not true. Whether we like it or not, it really, it's just fact. There's a continuum of consciousness, and that is our continuum. And so what about the future? And so the person of, middle, of small scope is already anticipating, what can I do now to ensure, not just, a, not just a favorable life, like I can be a deva in the next lifetime, 
and have a lot of fun. What the, that's rather superficial. But rather, how can I maintain continuity throughout the course of this lifetime and to the next and the next? What can I do now to make sure there's a continuity of practice? And with that motivation, then one may practice. That's good. It's larger vision. It's kind of long-term vision, not just going for short-term gratification. But then if one thinks, yeah, but what's the point of that? What's the point of practicing from lifetime to lifetime? It's not just to have a nice samsara. It's actually to get out of samsara, to be free of klesha and karma, mental afflictions and the actions that are conditioned by mental afflictions. It's really about freedom. That's why Gautama left home. I often like to say Gautama did not leave home so he could practice dharma. He could have practiced dharma very well and been a wonderful king. He didn't need to leave his wife, his children, his family behind to practice dharma. He made that enormous sacrifice to find liberation. But then we think, if I achieve liberation, but my family I leave behind, and my friends I leave behind, and my broader family, all sentient beings, I leave behind, and I go off by myself and never come back, just wave goodbye as I'm about to die, how can that be satisfying? How can that be the highest goal? When I'm leaving everybody behind and basically saying thumbs up, good luck, but I'm never coming back. It's not satisfying. Not as an ultimate goal. I can't accept that. For myself, no, not enough. And so therefore we think, all right, but how can we then be of greatest possible service? And then of course, there's only one answer. It's bodhicitta. The aspiration to achieve perfect enlightenment. And as Shantideva says, for as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, so long shall I remain to alleviate the suffering of the world. So there's the Bodhisattva aspiration. Tisha laid this out, a person of small scope, a person of medium scope, aspiring for liberation, with intensity as if your hair is on fire, and then the person of great scope, aspiring for perfect enlightenment of a Buddha. So those are the classic teachings. I think many of you are all very familiar with them. Those are the teachings that Atisha wrote specifically in response to the king. And the king who invited him, and the king said, speaking to Atisha, he was like the president of Oxford or the president of Harvard University. He was a great scholar, renowned in India. They got a celebrity. They got the creme de la creme. You know, in getting him, they were incredibly fortunate. And there's a story, it's worth telling. It was his father, the king's father, who actually invited Atisha to come to Tibet. He pleaded with him. He pleaded with him, please come. Dharma has degenerated a lot. You're the, you're the greatest. You're a great scholar. You're a great bodhisattva. You're a great, you're a great sadhu. You're a great, you know, a great adept. You're everything. We need you. So he was really looking for the best. Why not? You know? And all they had was money. They were really quite primitive. Tibet was not a very cultured society at that time. This is 11th century, eh? So a lot of degeneration. But then in the meantime, as Atisha was thinking, gosh, that's a big sacrifice to go up to this, you know, hillbillies, you know, this very primitive country. And here he is. He's, he's the abbot of one of the greatest monasteries or universities in all of India. But in the meantime, that king who invited him, he was... He was, there was a war, he, his country was attacked, he was imprisoned. It's like playing chess. They captured the king, and then they used him for ransom. You don't want to kill the king, you want to get money for him. So the opposing king captured the king who invited Atisha, and he said, I'll let you out, just give us your body weight in gold. Give us your body weight in gold, and when you go home, then we can play this game again. You know? But when the king heard that his... his his population, his country, they were, ra they were searching around to get enough gold to match his body weight, to get him out of prison. He said, no, raise the gold, yes, but I want to stay in prison. Take that gold and offer it to Atisha. Take that gold. I don't mind dying in prison, but offer that gold to Atisha. This is our reverence. This is my reverence. And Atisha came. So, so then his son, when Atisha did come, he wound up spending the rest of his life there, 13 years, when Atisha came, then the king, now the, who, the prince who had become king, he said, Lord, we Tibetans were not a very cultivated or sophisticated people, so please lay out the path for us in a way that is short and easy to understand, that we can readily practice. So then he gave them Lamrim, and that became widely disseminated. I think Atisha wrote it in Sanskrit, but he helped with the translation into Tibetan, <laughs> you know, because he was both a translator as well as a great pundit. 
So those teachings became very widely disseminated and then filtered into, flowed into all schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah. But there was another teaching. And the other teaching was a teaching that was more restricted. It wasn't public teaching for, I don't know how long, but for quite a long time. It was not a public teaching. It was for very dedicated practitioners of sharp faculties, great dedication, great faith, great aspiration to achieve enlightenment in this lifetime. And for those, he had a special teaching. And that was the seven point mind training. And it passed on for some time only as an oral teaching. Only as an oral teaching. And eventually it was written down by Geshe Chekala. And so it was written down. And then a close disciple of his, I think it was a direct disciple, very little known, named Sechu Bua. Sechu Bua then wrote down commentary to the root text. And I have a copy of that. Maybe the earliest commentary. I have a handwritten copy. I never saw it printed or in block print. I never saw it, but I have a handwritten copy. And so then I kind of know, have some appreciation of what was the earliest commentarial continuum or stream for this text. So this was a text for people of sharp faculties. Not just high intelligence, but for people with very strong dedication, motivation, and really ready to absolutely dedicate themselves to practice with the intention, the aspiration and intention to gain profound realization in this lifetime. So it takes a somewhat different approach. It's a different approach, very complementary. Now eventually, the Seven Point Mind Training also became public teaching, of course, and I received this about 40 years ago. It was about 1974. And by that time, I just want to give a tiny bit to show the continuity. That this commentary, the continuum, is not something I'm making up, but it's a continuum I've received from my teacher. And so I was a monk at that time, no longer a monk, but I was a monk at that time, studying very hard in the in a, the Sindhya Lapta, or the Buddhist School of Dialectics. Very intensive training, but there was a lot of philosophy and debating and debating, and I wanted something just for practice. And so by that time I was fluent in Tibetan, I could read, I could speak, and I could pretty much ask any Lama for teaching, and they'd probably give it, because they're so open, so free, so freely giving Dharma. So of, of all the Lamas that I met, there was one I especially wanted. I asked, I asked him, would you please give me seven-point mind training? He was not a monk. His name was Kumabashi. Anybody who knows Dharmasala 40 years ago, he was known, re tremendously revered, greatly respected. He was a layperson, he was an aristocrat. He was the chief teacher of Tibetan medicine, Tibetan astronomy, of poetry, of literature. He was a pundit, he was a great scholar. And in Tibet he had been an aristocrat, a gentleman scholar. Right? And then, uh, so, the occupation took place, he was an aristocrat, and therefore he and his family, then being aristocrats, they were targets. And so he had to flee. And so he went from being at the top, the highest level of Tibetan society, fleeing with nothing, down to India, where he had nothing then. He was a beggar, and he lived, so here he was, the chief teacher of Tibetan medicine outside of Tibet, the great scholar, and he was living on about $30, $1 a day, that was his salary. And he was living in a little shack, one-room shack. That's where I received teaching from him. And he transformed all of this into Dharma. He went through great adversity. He lost many family members, went through great personal adversity, from the highest level to very low level. And yet, no animosity, no resentment, no anger. And when he speak of the Chinese, he said, and he said it with sincerity, which was incredible. Speaking of the Chinese communists, he said, I owe them a debt of gratitude. And he wasn't he wasn't doing anything except for be speaking the truth. He said, because of what occurred in Tibet, this had much deepened my practice. Before that, when I was living in Tibet, it was quite easy. I could take everything for granted. I was an aristocrat, I could study, I had a very nice, comfortable life. But now everything changed, and now I see the value of Dharma. And his dedication, his faith, his commitment to practice was much, much deeper. And he said, that's because of what took place in Tibet. And so he transformed everything into Dharma. And when I saw how he did that, I said, okay, I want to receive from him. Because he has really learned how to transform adversity into the path. So that's just very short, the lineage. And so this is a text, oh, a couple of years ago, I spent eight weeks teaching and practicing this text in Phuket, Thailand. And so it's very rich, you can really unpack it. But if you're here, we have maybe an hour or so. So I'd like just to give the gist and kind of the flavor of this approach which is complementary to the classic Lam Rim. And where it starts, so I'll give a little bit of beginning. So it's called the Seven Point Mind Training. This was put together, assembled by Atisha, 
But again, there's an oral transmission for some generations, and eventually what Geshe Chekha will have written down. So he wrote it down, but he's not really the author. He just simply put it into writing. And so the text, it begins, so it has seven points. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, but I'll give a bit more detail at the beginning. Yeah? And so the first point is the preliminaries. It's called Mundo in Tibetan. Mundo. And the Tibetan reads, Dambo Mundo Dalalap. First of all, train in the preliminaries. Train in the preliminaries. Now, I've received many teachings over the last about 45 years now from all schools of Tibetan Buddhism. And all of these great lamas from all of the traditions, they very strongly emphasize the preliminaries. They know that people are wanting to kind of get through the preliminaries to the main practice. So, okay, can, how quickly can we get through those? Why don't you skip those? Let's get to the, get to the main practice. We're quite eager, a bit impatient, right? But these great lamas of all the traditions, they say, no, in fact, the preliminaries are the most important. Don't go through them quickly. This is most important. And so when we see, what, what is he referring to here when he says, Dambo Mundo Dalalap, first of all, train in the preliminaries. What preliminaries? There are many of them. Well, here we know, because we have the early commentary, we have what, would they, what they put in there. Because you can put in all kinds of things. And what they put in are called in Tibetan the Lodo Lamji, the four ways of reversing the mind, turning the right mind right about, like 180 degrees. If you, if, when you first start, you're going this direction. It's designed to make you go this direction. And so we have a word for that in English. Revolution. Revolution. The scientific revolution. Going from the notion of the earth being in the center and everything being around us, to turning that all the way around, the sun in the center, and we're just going around the sun. That's a revolution, right? Darwin, that was a revolution. Modern <laughs> physics, quantum mechanics, well, it, it's a revolution that you have to think in the opposite way. Instead of absolute space, time, matter, energy, and no space, time, matter, energy on the as absolute level. So it means a fundamental shift in your perspective on reality. So what are these four? Each of these four is designed to bring about a true revolution, not in the way you think about stars or planets or evolution or elementary particles, but the way you think about your own existence. Your own existence. To radically transform, to revolutionize the way you're viewing yourself, your own existence, your life, and your death. And so I'm going to be very brief here. And what I'd like to do now is speak a bit slowly. Because as, as I reviewed this morning, when I was teaching, I was really trying to give some framework, some background, and so you would learn, maybe be inspired by the Buddhist teachings of the significance of samadhi for enlightenment. And so it was designed that I was teaching you and you could reflect upon the teachings that I was giving. And then Geshe-la, very shortly after that, then geshe -la wasn't giving a teaching so much, but taking us directly into practice. So maybe for the first 20 minutes, half an hour, you didn't learn anything new. But here we are in this sacred place, and what a better, what better place to practice Dharma. So he's taking us right into the refuge, the bodhicitta, the four immeasurables. Maybe no new information, but it was about practice, right? And then later he gave a bit more teaching. What I'd like to do now is to take my approach and Gishala's approach and then put them together. So there'll be some teaching here. But what I invite you to do as you're listening to the teaching is practice at the same time. Don't just say, oh, that's what Buddhism says, that's what Atisha says, not like that. But if my words strike you as true, then immediately meditate. So not later, but now. So I'll speak a bit slowly, but if right now you can be practicing as we do with geshe -la, then we're taking full advantage of this really sacred place. So what are these four contemplations? Each of which is designed to reverse or turn around an attitude we probably already have. The first attitude, and then you can see, I'm, get, I'm like showing you a shoe, and you see whether the shoe fits. So I'm going to tell you an attitude, and see whether it's ever been your attitude. And that is your attitude about being human being. And so your attitude is, well, my father has a sperm, my mother had an egg, they got together, what else would I be? Of course I'm a human being, what else would I be? They had sex, I'm here. I'm a human being, so big deal, right? So, so what? I'm a human being, so what? And as you're not only human, but you've also encountered teachers and authentic teachings, you've encountered the path, you have the whole dawn before you, you have all of these conducive environments. Yeah, yeah, it's good, whatever. It's very easy to take for granted the fact that we are human beings, and not only as human beings, 
but we have right in the palm of our hand, right accessible, authentic teachers, authentic teaching, conducive environment, we have intelligence, we have faith, we have, we're like a cook who walks into the kitchen and everything you have that you need for a wonderful meal, it's everything there, there. All you have to do is put it together and cook it. We have all the ingredients, outer and inner, to put it together to achieve enlightenment, even in this lifetime. Certainly to have favorable rebirth, certainly to achieve liberation, but even enlightenment, even enlightenment in this lifetime. The teachings are there. So there's nothing missing. All we have to do is put it together. How precious is that? Shantideva says, this, this basis of leisure, this life, this body we have now of leisure is more valuable than a wish-fulfilling jewel. So in, in ancient Buddhist lore, a, a wish-fulfilling jewel is a jewel, you polish it, you show it reverence, and then you direct your thoughts to it, and it will provide you with any mundane desire you like. Wealth, fame, prestige, anything you like, poof, magical stone. But the body you have is more valuable than that. More valuable than that. It's with that. You get it, and then you lose it. You die, you leave everything behind. Whereas here we can cultivate a wealth that carries on from lifetime to lifetime all the way to Buddhahood. And so we see, if we really reflect upon this like right now, how precious is this human life that we have now? And within human life, having all the opportunity on all the leisure, the outer, the inner, Dharma friends, spiritual teachers, spiritual teaching, we don't have to spend every moment just surviving. So a number of, in our group, we know we've been traveling a lot by bus over the last couple of days. As we look out the window, how many of the people we saw do you think had much leisure? Just to sit quietly, spend a week here, a month there, maybe go for a month-long retreat and so forth. How many do you think that had that leisure to really be able to devote themselves just to practice? Maybe even longer retreat. I think they're pretty much right on these, the marginal level of just getting by. Yeah? And so maybe they can do a few prayers in the evening. That's about it. The rest are taking care of their children, they're trying to make a living, they're selling the bananas, they're selling their peanuts, they're fixing bicycle tires. How much profit do you think there is in that? You know, and it's an honest living. I hope you know I'm not speaking with any degree of condescension whatever. It's an honest living, that's good. When I go to Mexico also I see. So many, I see no beggars in India, in Mexico. I see no beggars. I see people washing a windshield, selling balloons, selling flowers in the middle of traffic. That's an honest living. I have only respect for that. Oh, it's so difficult. And here you are making an honest living. I respect. I respect. That's not an easy life. You're living in the middle of traffic with all the traffic fumes and you're trying to make an honest living. Oh, that moves me. Oh, I have respect for that be so easy to turn to crime or to begging anything else. No, they're trying to make an honest living, working hard, but no leisure and no opportunity. And here we are, we have nothing to do all day, practice Dharma. And so to stop, even for a moment, the notion of taking for granted what we have. Every moment is precious, every week is precious. The leisure and opportunity is unbelievably precious and so rare. And again, all we have to do, now we have, we're almost like have clairvoyance. You watch CNN, you're clairvoyant. You go to the internet, you're clairvoyant. There's a disaster in China, we know about it. Why? We have our clairvoyance of internet. Or there's another civil war, there's another car bombing, or there's this or that, we know about it. So we know what's happening with the seven billion people, and that's human beings. We know how rare it is, and that's just within human beings, let alone all the other realms of existence. So to recognize what I have right now, the wealthiest people on the planet probably don't have. They don't have. They could buy whole towns. They could buy whatever they like. But do they have a life of leisure and opportunity? Do they have dharma in the palm of the hand? Many don't. They're not that fortunate. So who's more fortunate? A Carlos Slim, a Bill Gates, the other rich people who can't even count how many billions they have, or we who have dharma? What would you rather be? You or a person who has no dharma, but oh, so much wealth, so much prestige, so much status. Which would you choose? Yeah. This is more precious here, what we have here. Because all that wealth, the prestige, the power, gives not even a tiniest bit of inner satisfaction, of genuine happiness. You can't buy it. 
Dharma leads us directly there. So here we are. But it's so easy to take advantage. I just had my health checked up. Blood tests and this and the doctor and this and they check my heart and so forth. I'm in good health. Oh, that's good. Now I live for another 30 years. Unless I get hit by a truck tomorrow. Or maybe I have some brain anomaly. Maybe I'm dying tomorrow. Oh, I'm dead. S stroke. I'm not, too, I'm not too young. I'm not too old. Not too young or old. I can die anytime. Anytime. Nobody should be surprised if tomorrow I'm dead in my bed. It can happen. Why not? Why not? Maybe I'll live 30 years. Maybe I'll live 30 minutes. No guarantee. The only thing I can be certain of, apart from taxes, the other one, death. That I can be certain of. And so to hold that in mind, to cherish that. The Buddha said of all the, the footprints of the animals, land animals, the biggest footprint is the footprint of an elephant. And of all of the topics that we may contemplate to really dwell on, to make the biggest imprint on our lives, the biggest transformation, is reflection on impermanence. And so to not take for granted the notion that, oh yes, of course I'll live a long life, of course I'll remain healthy, of course, of course, no guarantee whatsoever. To be aware every single day that we're in good health, the mind is clear, every single day, so precious, so precious. That's the second revolution. And the third revolution has to do with what will make us happy. We all want to be happy. We don't have to be religious or spiritual. We don't have to believe in reincarnation. We already want it. But so often as we really strive to find happiness, we're looking outside. And so the question comes, is there such a thing as a source of happiness? Is there such a thing as a source of happiness? And if there is such a thing as a source of happiness, it should be, whenever you go to it, it will provide you with happiness. And the longer you engage with it, the longer it will provide you happiness. That's the source. So, out in the desert, I've lived in the desert where there's artesian wells, water coming right out of the so stone, out of the sand. And every time you go to the artesian well, it gives you water. And the longer you stay, the more water you get. So you say, that's a source of water. Every time you go, it's water. The longer you stay, the more water you get. So now think of all the things out there, people, places, prestige, power, wealth, everything. What out there is an actual source of happiness? So that you know every time you go to it, you'll find happiness. And the longer you engage, the longer you'll find happiness. Now tell me, what out there is the truth? Even a physical lama, if you have a person, a human being as your lama, can you say, oh yes, this lama, Dala Lama, Kamapa, this lama, this great Rinpoche, this Tuku, he is a source of my happiness. Can you say, is it true? Every time with your lama, you're always happy. And the longer you stay with the lama, you're, all, you're happier, happier, happier? I don't think so. We take refuge in the Lama, but we're not taking refuge in the body. And the Lama as a person out there is not a source of our happiness. He's a physician. He or she is a physician, showing us the way. But it's very easy to have attachment to the Lama. It's very easy to have attachment to Buddha Dhamma as an object. Think, oh, Buddha Dhamma will give me happiness. Oh, Namo Buddha Dhamma, as is some object of the mind. I don't think so. Buddha Dhamma is not an object of the mind. Dom Dumba, the great disciple of Atisha, when he was asked, what is it to practice Dharma? He said, give up all attachment to this life and let your mind become Dharma. Not have Dharma as an object. Your mind is a Dharma. So this is another revolution. To recognize having good companions, a wonderful spouse, healthy children, a good job, a conducive place to live, all of that's good. But none of that is an actual source of happiness. And there is only one, and that of course is your own mind. The others may or may not contribute, but there's no guarantee. And so the reality of suffering, the nature of suffering, the nature of dukkha. And it says in Tibetan, dungalwa. Every experience we have that is conditioned by, tainted by our own mental afflictions, dungalwa. Every experience we have, whether it's with a spouse, with children, with friends, in solitude, in society, working or entertaining, any experience we have, that is conditioned by mental afflictions, like delusion, craving, hostility, everyone will be unsatisfying. Doesn't matter what it is, it'll be unsatisfying. Not because the object is unsatisfying, not because it's bad, but the way we're experiencing being conditioned by mental affliction guarantees it will be unsatisfying. So therefore seeing, aha, if I want to be free of suffering, there's only one realistic way. I have to transform my mind. There's no, there's no other way. There's only one way. Purify your mind. 
And then finally, among these four thoughts that radically turn the mind, the fourth one is then really reflecting upon karma, actions and their consequences. Actions and their consequences. To really reflect on, to seep the mind in the reality that every action, every deliberate action of body, speech, or mind, as soon as we have an intention, that already is now, we are sowing, we are like farmers, and we're sowing the field. We are creating our destiny, not fate, not God, not Buddha, nothing outside, not atoms or particles or laws of physics. We right now are creating our future by every intentional act we engage in. We are responsible for what we're bringing to the world because it will come back. <coughs> if we really saturate our minds in these four realities, they turn everything around. And our attitude to our own life, the lives of others, fundamentally shifts. And so this is really all about aspiration. And that is, there's a phrase, let your practice become dharma, let your dharma become the path. And that is the mere fact that we're meditating. Is there any guarantee, by the fact that we're meditating, any guarantee that we're practicing dharma? No guarantee at all. And it doesn't matter whether you're practicing Theravada or Zen or Chan or Mahayana or Vajrayana or Dzogchen. It doesn't matter. There's no guarantee. Whatever you call it, there's no guarantee it's even dharma. What determines whether it's dharma or not? Let's say you're sitting and you're following the sensations of the breath at your nostrils. Is that dharma? It's a big question mark. It's not how well you do it or how single-pointedly you're focusing. Maybe you're doing that so you can be a better sniper. So I can blow people's brains out with much greater, higher accuracy. Maybe that's your motivation. That's not dharma. That's just preparing to kill. So every moment you're following your breath, you're developing negative karma because you're preparing to kill more effectively. Yes. Maybe it's because you want more money. Or nowadays, mindfulness, mindfulness, mindfulness. Very good. Very good. But what's the motivation? Simply to redu reduce stress? Valium. Va taking Valium is not Dharma. Practicing mindfulness just to reduce stress, that's not Dharma. It's a stress reduction technique. Very good, but it's not Dharma. So the Dalai Lama was asked once, I was translating for him, 1989. When someone asked him, what do you think of this modern mindfulness movement? Where well, they're taking much from Buddhism, but not giving Buddha any credit, and they're using it for stress reduction. And then all the health benefits, and then we see mindfulness in the marketplace, and mindfulness to make more money, mindfulness to have better emotional intelligence, and so forth. What do you think of this, Your Holiness? I was there, I know what he said. And he said, this is very good. He said, the whole point of Buddha Dhan is to alleviate suffering. And if you decontextualize some practices of mindfulness, mindfulness of breathing, maybe yoga, take it out of the whole context of Four Noble Truths, everything, take it all by itself, like clicking with tweezers, pull it out and put it into modernity, and it helps to alleviate suffering, that's good. Because we're not here to convert people, we're here to help alleviate suffering. He said that, it's good. And then he added, but don't mistake that for Buddha Dharma. Don't mistake that for Dharma. Now, His Holiness is known for a long time that I'm very keen on shamatha. And in another of these meetings for which I was serving as interpreter, His Holiness startled me, but then I immediately knew what he was saying. He said, shamatha. Shamatha is not dharma. Shock therapy. Shamatha is not dharma. But of course he's right. Whether you're focusing on a Buddha image, is that guaranteed? No, it's just a, it's a visualization technique. Maybe you're watching your thoughts, very nice, but is that dharma? No guarantee. You're watching your breath, forget about it. You're practicing whatever, whatever technique. Yes, you're practicing shaman. Is that dharma or not? It's not on how well you're practicing, it's what your motivation is. So this is why, especially in Mahayana Buddhism, in Tibetan Buddhism, this enormous emphasis on motivation, whether your practice is actually dharma or not, doesn't depend on the technique. It depends on your motivation. This is why we begin with refuge in bodhicitta. And then we have this phrase, and may your dharma turn into the path. It's very good to practice dharma. Then it's virtue, then it's really meaningful. It's not just to overcome your hemorrhoids or a rash or something like that. Meditation for hemorrhoids, you know, there is such a thing. You know. Not just to get more money or a better, a better sex life and so forth. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not dharma. The Dharma becoming path, 
Is your, is, your, is your Dharma practice, is it leading on your path that will bring about irreversible transformation? Because that's what path is. We can practice Dharma where you cultivate some good karma, you get some good benefit, and then it's finished. And then you cultivate some more karma, and then it's finished. But Shantideva, when he speaks of bodhicitta, he said this is like a perennial tree that gives fruit every year, year after year after year. So bodhicitta developing the most sublime of motivations. Then this now turns to the path the path that you're now on a path of, one can say, spiritual evolution, of real deep transformation that eventually, when we go deep enough, is irreversible. And that's what the path is really about. I, I, I find that immeasurably inspiring, that I can not only practice Dharma, but actually my Dharma can lead to the path. And it fundamentally hinges on motivation. So that's why Atisha here, when he says, first of all, practice the preliminaries, he's talking about motivation. And it's above a ball, he hasn't gone yet to Bodhicitta. It's interesting. But that's not there yet. He knows as well as anybody that the bodhicitta is absolutely central to the whole Mahayana path. But it's not the first thing he teaches. First thing he teaches is develop an authentic motivation, recognizing that samsara as samsara, suffering as suffering, what are the actual causes of suffering, the actual causes of happiness? Develop an authentic motivation. So that's where it begins, right? So if you're a navigator and you're setting out on a long voyage of exploration, the first thing you want to know is, where are my navigation charts and where am I headed? You're not just going out into the ocean, you have some destination in mind, and that's motivation. So that's the first point, and it's only one line. First, do the preliminaries, right? Get an authentic motivation. So in Saranath, I'll speak about cognitive intelligence, and cognitive is all about aspiration and, and intention, and it's bringing our best wisdom. It's what in the Eightfold Noble Path is called authentic intention, sometimes called right thought. It's not really right thought. It's authentic and it's intention, not just thought. And that's crucial in the Eightfold Noble Path. And so that's the first one. Now obviously I'm not going to spend as much time on the other six points. But there it is. It cannot be overemphasized. So a simple practice of just breathing in and out for five, five minutes, if the motivation is authentic, it's really to get to the root of suffering to lead a wholesome life of ethics, samadhi, leading to wisdom. Five minutes of following the breath in and out. That's Dharma, right? That's Dharma. We're going into a three-year retreat because you want to develop psychic powers. That's not Dharma. That's just trying to get psychic powers. Good luck. And it doesn't matter whether it's Vajrayana has some great, sublime, very high status practice. If the motivation isn't there, it's not Dharma. Even it's called Vajrayana, it's called Dzogchen or what have you. It's all motivation. Now, here's a little secret. Everybody knows that first line. Everybody who knows the seven-point mind training. But I have this old, this, this handwritten copy of this very ancient text by Sajibua. And there's a line there that I've seen in his commentary and I've not seen anywhere else. So now you get this secret inside scoop. After the first, first point, first train in the preliminaries, then there's the second line I've never seen it in any other of the later redactions or versions of the text. The rest of the text is pretty common, pretty standard in all the different traditions. But the next line in this very ancient version is in Tibetan, Tempa Topne Sangwate, having achieved stability, let the mystery be revealed. Let the mystery be revealed. Let the secret, Sangwa means like something secret, something veiled, something hidden, like a mystery. Having achieved stability, let the secret, the mystery, be revealed. So I read that, and then read the commentary. Ho ho, I'm so glad, in a way it turned out well, that we had the talk on samadhi and enlightenment this morning, because what is this stability? What is stability of mind? It's shamatha. It's developing that relaxation, the stability, the clarity of attention, so that your mind becomes serviceable. Serviceable malleable, stable, clear, supple, and then you apply that to your course investigation, your subtle analysis, you're ready to launch into vipassana, into bodhicitta, but you have a mind that it's like if the mind were a car, you're behind the steering wheel, and you have the, the brake and the accelerator here, you're actually driving the car. But we all know what it's like, don't we? I think all of us have meditated, at least some. Have you ever sat down to meditate and say, now I'm going to meditate for 20 minutes? and five seconds later, somebody else is driving your car. You're sitting in the back seat, and it's a drunk at the steering wheel. 
going here and going there. Wee, wee, wee. I said, no, no, please take a left. Yeah, I'm going to go right. No, take a right. No, I want to go left. Please slow down. No, I think I'm going to go faster. Who's driving the car? Not you. If you can't sit for a half an hour and say, I want to drive straight for one half hour, and five seconds later you're taking a right, you're not driving the car. So what's driving your car? Your mental afflictions. They're not your friend. And so, great, the great Tsongkhapa, a tremendous admirer of Atisha, he said, once you've achieved shamatha, now you have a mind. Once you've achieved shamatha, now you have a mind. Until then, the mind has you. Or there was one movie, I won't elaborate, but there was one movie. Well, I'll tell. <laughs> Little Miss Sunshine. You remember when they tied the dog to the back of the station wagon? And then they forgot about the dog? So it's a comedy, so we don't have to be sorry for the dog. No animal was harmed in the production of this movie. But when the dog's being dragged behind the car, does the dog have a car, or does the car have a dog? And when we're being dragged by dullness, by agitation, excitation, mind wandering, and so forth, who has the mind? Do you have a mind, or does the mind have you? Who, who or what is behind the steering wheel, you know? And so this is why Atisha says, in, in exactly the spirit of Lord Buddha, that I discussed at some length this morning, if you really want to bring about profound transformation, deep, irreversible transformation, if you want to develop bodhicitta so deeply that it arises spontaneously, effortlessly, you want to become a bodhisattva? Good! Develop a mind that works and use that mind to cultivate bodhicitta, use that mind to practice vipassana. Stage regeneration, completion, Vajrayana, and Dzogchen, very good, but get a mind that works. And so that's why Atisha said, having achieved stability, so upon having authentic motivation, make the mind serviceable, make the mind firm, unified, samadhi. The term samadhi is a very nice word. Sam means totally, completely. A is an intensifier, means like very or extremely. And da comes from the Sanskrit verbal root, means to place or to put. So it's completely, really, putting. What's that? It's the unification of the mind. So if I wish to attend to Rosario, I give you my full attention. Boom! I give you my full attention. When we're having a conversation with someone, we should give them the full attention. If we're making a gift to someone, we should give them our full attention. One Benedictine monk, I will quote him here in Bodhagaya, very dear friend of mine, he said, the greatest gift we can give to another person is our attention. And we know if we don't give our attention, we won't give anything else. If we don't give our attention, we'll not give anything else. If we do give our attention, we've given something of great value. And then all good can flow from that. If our hearts are open, so this is why he goes from cognitive intelligence to developing attention, making the mind serviceable. But now for what? Having achieved stability, now reveal the mystery. Now reveal the great secret. And what's that? The nature of existence. The nature of existence. So we know in the long rim, in this, in this strategy, it's a wonderful strategy, but it's not the only strategy. In the long rim, everything step by step. Uh, the, the, the meditation is designed to really disentent yourself from all the allures of this life. The pleasures, the hedonic pleasures of this life be tending to future life, very good. But then saying, but the whole of samsara is all saturated by dissatisfaction. And then developing the aspiration for liberation. And then saying, but this is too limited, it's only for myself, I must go larger. And you develop bodhicitta. And then developing bodhicitta, then you say, but now how do I express, how do I engage in the bodhisattva way of life? With that, what Geshe was talking about this morning, not only the aspiring bodhicitta, but the engaging bodhicitta. How do we do that? Practice the six perfections, step by step, generosity, and then ethics, and then patience, and then enthusiasm, step by step, in sequence. And then after that, after the first four perfections, then comes jhana, perfection of meditation, jhana, jhana, as in first, second, third, fourth jhana. And then the final one. And Shantideva says, all the first five perfections, they're for the sake of the sixth one. All of them for the sake of the sixth, and the sixth is the perfection of wisdom. But what immediately precedes the perfection of wisdom, the perfection of meditation. And that's jhana. That's, some, that's shamatha. Right? And so that's the classic procedure. Very widely practiced. 
but interesting, it's not the only one. And so in these early days when this seven-point mind training was passed on only from, oh, I think you're very ripe. I will pass on teaching I don't give publicly. Because it would be too hard. It would be like a very steep hill. And if your engine is not strong enough, you just get and you'll slip. And you say, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, I bet you're not going up the hill. But if you have four-wheel drive and very good traction, even if it's a very steep hill, then maybe that's a shortcut, a very fast track. And that's what the seven-point mind training is. He goes directly from the developing renunciation, from the four thoughts, to developing shamatha, making the mind firm, stable, coherent, and goes directly to teachings on emptiness. He goes directly to ultimate bodhicitta. The standard way is relative bodhicitta first, and go through the six perfections, you get to the sixth perfection, that's a perfection of wisdom, that's ultimate bodhicitta. That's very good. Not the only way. For those who are ripe, they may go directly there. Now, geshe told me something very interesting. He's an excellent scholar. He's got went the whole through Geshe training. So this means he has great erudition. There's no question. And he's debated for years and years and years, and he has a great enthusiasm, great erudition for Madhyamaka, the middle way view of Nagarjuna, the perfection of wisdom. He debates this. He's thought about it for years and years and years. And as a result of that, some insight, some clarity has come. But what he told me just a couple of days ago, in just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He said, I've been teaching some people who are quite new to Dharma. He spoke of one woman. I can't remember, I think she was an artist maybe, but something not really Buddha Dharma at all. But she came, she was kind of interested, and he took her right into meditation. So she's going directly to meditation, but no big teaching, 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 just right into meditation. And then he was asking her and some of his other fairly recent students, asking them deep questions, tough questions, from Majamaka the teachings on emptiness, the teachings on perfection of wisdom. And he said, they really surprised me. They have very little background in Dharma, very little knowledge, very little training and teaching and textual knowledge, but the answers coming spontaneously from the meditation, those are the answers I would have given after years and years and years of training. He said, oh, that's a wake-up call. Maybe, maybe there are people nowadays like us right here. Maybe we didn't have the opportunity to spend 10, 20 years learning text, memorizing text, debating for hundreds and thousands of hours, maybe you don't have the opportunity. But if the mind is ripe, you go into meditation, the insights may come up spontaneously. So there's hope for us, even if we can't spend 20 years in a monastery. And so this is the approach that Tisha is taking here. And just to give a little bit, again, I'm not going to give detail and we will not spend much more time here, but this is quite thrilling it's quite an adventure. This is drama. Because we're going right into the depths from the beginning. We're going to get to relative bodhicitta by way of ultimate bodhicitta. That's exceptional. Because the standard way is ultimate bodhicitta by way of relative bodhicitta. That's going in the shallow end of the pool into the deep end. But Atisha is now just throwing you into the deep end and said, okay, sink or swim. And then out of your ultimate bodhicitta, out of realization of emptiness and dependent origination, from that you may go directly into relative bodhicitta and find your relative bodhicitta is springing forth from ultimate bodhicitta. Now, there are many methods of shamatha. But in the Mahamudra and Dzogchen traditions, and one or other is found in all schools of Tibetan Buddhism, so in the new translation schools, the Kagyu, the Sakya, the Giluk, more Mahamudra, but it's taught in all, th all three traditions. In the old translation school of Nyingma, more emphasis on Dzogchen. But in these two traditions, very complementary, a lot of common ground, Dzogchen, the great perfection, and the Mahamudra, the great seal, both of these whole approaches to meditation are fundamentally aimed at realizing the nature of the mind, right down to the ground state of Buddha nature, or Rikpa, pristine awareness, or Yeshe, primordial consciousness, but really realizing your Buddha nature, realizing Dharmakaya, realizing Buddha, Buddha mind, that's the core theme. And it entails Vipassana, and it entails then the actual practices of Mahamudra and Dzogchen themselves. But for all, both of these traditions, for Mahamudra and Dzogchen, if you read the classics, don't necessarily just rely on the popularized versions, where they're trying to give us a short, shortcut. Go for the professional literature, the ones that have been practiced for a thousand years by the greatest adepts of Tibet and earlier than that in India, 
and you'll see invariably shamatha is indispensable. It's indispensable. It may be overlooked, it may be marginalized, but I'm sorry, you're not following the teachings of the Buddha, you're not following Theravada, you're not following Mahayana, and you're not following Vajrayana if you skip shamatha, let alone if you skip Vipassana. So, it's just possible maybe there's some degeneration of Buddha Dharma today when people maybe spend three years in retreat doing all kinds of rituals and chanting and visualizations and mantras very good and they finish three retreats. Oh, I finished my three retreats. Did you do shamatha? No. How about Vipassana? No, no. Well, that's very good, but then there's no path. And it doesn't matter whether you do it two times, three times. If you haven't practiced shamatha Vipassana, you don't have a path. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. That's not my opinion. And that's whether you're following Shravakayana, Mahayana, or Vajrayana. Shamatha and Vipassana are the core of all of Buddhist meditation, regardless of school. That's the way it is. You don't have to agree with me, but what I've just said is what the Buddha has said and the greatest teachers of all traditions have said since then. So in Mahamudra tradition, in the Dzogchen tradition, they look at the wide array of shamatha methods and there's a wonderful selection, a great variety. It's like going into an ice cream shop and saying, oh, so many flavors. And that's wonderful. And these flavors, these different modes of shamatha are designed for people with different temperaments. But shamatha is always a preparation. In the Buddha Dharma, shamatha is always a means to an end, but it's not the end, right? It's not shamatha for the sake of shamatha. So let's imagine, for example, that you're a Tibetan Buddhist and you really have great yearning, great faith, great aspiration to practice stage of generation, stage of completion, in whatever version, Vajra Yogini, Goya Samaja, Kala Chakra, whatever you're drawn to. Let's imagine that. Well, anybody who knows about stage regeneration, the Kedim, there's a lot of visualization, lots of visualization of yourself as a deity, the mandala, a lot of visualization. If you want to do that effectively, with stability and clarity, then the method of shamatha, why not start developing your visualization abilities now? And that's taught in all four schools of Tibetan Buddhism. How about the Buddha in front of you, or Tad, or Manjushri, or Guru, Guru Rinpoche, or Tsongkhapa? Very good. It's an excellent preparation for this much more elaborate visualization you'll do when you go to stage regeneration and completion. But what if your great passion, above all, is to realize the nature of your mind, and all the way down to the ground, all the way down to Buddha nature? What if that's your primary aspiration, your great faith, your great passion? is I want to know my Buddha nature. Then what method might be selected among all the variety of shamatha methods? This is a wonderful variety. Well, both the Mahamudra and the Dzogchen traditions, the greatest teachers, Padmasambhava himself, Dujum Lingba, Ledap Lingba, the list goes on and on. In the, the, the Mahamudra tradition and Dzogchen tradition, they keep on coming back to one method, very strongly emphasized, and they all teach it. So there's nothing sectarian. It's not like Kagyu versus Gelukpa or Nyingma versus Sakya, nothing like that. Absolutely non-sectarian. But if your shamatha practice is really to enable you to move directly from there to Vipassana on the nature of the mind, to realize the emptiness of inherent nature of your own mind, and having realized the empty, empty nature, then to realize the ground, Rikpa, pristine awareness, Buddha nature. It's a very straight track. If that's your aspiration, if that's your vision, what direction are you going? What is your aspiration? Not just, I want to achieve enlightenment, but I want to go this path. If it's, if it's Mahamudra or Dzogchen, then the method that is most strongly emphasized in both traditions, in all schools of Tibetan Buddhism, is shamatha focus on the mind. And that is simply focusing single-pointedly on that domain of experience that is purely mental. So it's not open presence, it's not choiceless awareness, it's not bare attention, it's selective. Shamatha is always selective. But among the six domains of experience, the six domains, you're focusing on one. And that's the domain of experience in which thoughts, mental images, memories, fantasies, desires, emotions, and dreams, they all occur in that. So it's like having a cineplex with six theaters. You're only focusing on one theater. So you're really not giving any attention to the visual, the auditory, the tactile, the olfactory, or the gustatory. You're saying, all very well, but not now. Right now, I'm focusing single-pointedly on cinema number six. And that's the cinema of the mind. And that, that keeps on showing day and night. 
When you're dreaming, that cinema is still operating. They're still showing the films. When you're dreaming, because the dreamings take place in that domain. Right? And when we're awake, the thoughts, the images, the memories, the desires are all arising in that domain. So you can take that domain as your object of shamatha. Sem la shine, shamatha focused on the mind. And it goes by other names, but I won't elaborate. But that's what it is. You can take that as your object and single-pointedly focus there. And whatever comes up, you're focusing on that. Now imagine, now let's just go into imagination realm for a moment. You may not have spent 5,000 hours, 10,000 hours. You may not have spent six months or a year or longer practicing this for 8, 10, 12 hours a day. Many people have. But maybe you've not that, done that just yet. But now try to imagine. What would it be like if for 12 hours a day for a year, 12 hour days for two years, you wake up in the morning and you start focusing on your mind. And hour after hour you come out, you, you take something to eat, you drink, you go for a little walk and you go back. But just hour after hour, month after month, focusing single-pointedly on the mind and observing, simply observing whatever comes up, arises and passes, rises and passes. What's it like when you come out of practice, out of meditation, when you're engaging with the world? Well, this is an experiment that has been done. So I can simply tell you and you can try to imagine it. But it's an experiment that has been run thousands of times. First in India, then in Tibet, also China, and so on. Here's what the great adepts say. If you've been doing just a shamatha practice, let alone Vipassana or Mahamudra or anything like more advanced, when you come out of meditation, you're looking around and you see all these appearances, the sounds, the chanting, the birds, the imagery, the fragrance, maybe, you, you, maybe you're sucking a mint, you have some taste coming in, you feel the tactile sensations arising within your body, you feel the breeze, the coolness and so forth. So these appearances are all arising to your five physical senses, right? Where are all these appearances? Where are, these, where do, where are they located? The red that you see, the birds chirping, the sounds that you hear, the smells that you experience, the taste, the tackles, where are they? Are they out there? Out there in the physical world? Ask a neuroscientist. They'll say, no, no, it's not there. Ask a physicist. Are the colors out there? Are the sounds out there in the physical world? The objective physical world? They'll say, no, no, it's not there. It's not out there. It appears to be out there, but it's not out there. Now that was some theory. But if you've just spent, a five, let's say, 5,000 hours practicing this 12 hours a day, you come out of meditation, and I'll tell you what it feels like. This is like a dream. All those people seem to be really up there, but all the appearances are in my mind. They, none of these appearances exist outside my mind. Every appearance of memories, of hopes, of fears, of dreams, of sensory impressions, all of these are arising in the space of my mind. And they look solid, but how could there be anything solid, solid in my mind? They look physical, but how can there be th anything physical in my mind? Because my mind is not physical. And so you come out and you just see, with no philosophy, you see everything here is like a dream. Everything's like a dream. And this is what happens simply because of shamatha practice. So what's the first line from Atisha when he goes into the teachings on ultimate bodhicitta? the second of the seven points of the mind training, what does he say? Regard all events as if they were dreams. That's the first line. That which would come naturally, flowing right from your shamatha practice, is flowing right into your vipassana practice. And now this is once again a revolution. Because when we see people, situations, places and so forth, it seems to be totally out there. Just like in a non-lucid dream. Oh, there's a person way over there. Oh, there are people up there. Oh. Hear that sound up there, as if they're all out there. It's all illusion. And so now he's saying, all right, if you have this momentum from your shamatha practice, so you're already seeing things as a dream, now to reinforce that, but now with wisdom, and to recognize all of these appearances, they're all pratita samupada. These are all arising relative to my own awareness. But I'm never accessing, never perceiving, never apprehending anything that exists independently of my mind. It's all arising relative to my mind. And so I'm a full participant in all the reality I experience. It's all intertwined with my own mind and I never see anything outside my mind. So you're already taking a step towards 
realizing the illusory nature of waking reality. I'm looking where my glasses fell. Here we are. And so he starts there. View all phenomena as if they were dreams, right? And then, and that's just immediately. Start viewing this for what it is. This is like a dream right now. And then he goes on. Examine the unborn nature of awareness. So when you're engaging with reality around you, see everything as your dream, but then you go back into meditation. And you sit quietly. And you've already been practicing, let's imagine, this shamatha focus on the mind. And imagine you actually achieve shamatha, focus on the mind, so that your awareness is withdrawn from the sensory world. When you're coming out to the world, you see everything as being like a dream. You say, okay, now time for meditation. Bye. And you go. And your awareness is drawn inwards right into the domain of the mind single-pointedly. So imagine having achieved shamatha. And your mind goes into a state disengaged from the environment, disengaged from your body. You've gone purely into the mental realm, but it's empty. And you're simply abiding there in a state of bliss, of luminosity, of non-conceptuality. You're dwelling in shamatha, but now don't be satisfied. That was the final thing I said this morning. Don't be satisfied. Oh, you got bliss. Very nice. Don't be satisfied. Now, break through. Break through this conditioned mind. This conditioned mind of your continuum that goes on from lifetime to lifetime. Break through. By realizing the emptiness of your mind, break through to the dimension of unborn awareness. And that's Rikpa. That's Buddha nature. Break through to your own Buddha nature. And so there he goes directly from there. And so he continues there, but on a direct route of knowing the nature of reality by knowing the nature of the mind that apprehends reality. Now in the Mahamudra tradition, it's sometimes said, in the, in the pursuit of realizing emptiness, the ultimate nature of reality, the actual nature of reality, that all phenomena are empty of inherent nature, they said there are two approaches. This is from Kama Chakmet, the great Mahamudra and Dzogchen master. Hello. And he says, yes. We have this. Okay, good. And so in this, is this working though? Not really. Is it working? Is, it, is there amplification? Oh, now we have more competition. We'll continue though. They'll do their prayers, we do our teaching here. Kama Chakmet, who was a great master of Mahmudra and of Dzogchen, he said, as you move into Vipassana, you're moving beyond the mere bliss and so forth of shamatha to really knowing reality as it is and severing the root of samsara. There are two approaches. And one is to investigate the myriad of phenomena, all different types of phenomena, from atoms and life and all kinds of things, and to realize one by one, by studying Nagarjuna, by studying the great, the great treatises of Madhyamaka, to go through all the categories of the Abhidhamma, the different types of phenomena, and one by one realize the emptiness of inherent nature of each one. And in this way, then, you gain realization of all, the emptiness of all phenomena. He said that's one approach. But there's another approach, and that is go directly to the mind and realize for yourself, it, does your mind exist inherently by its own intrinsic characteristics, or is it empty of its own identity, empty of its own inherent nature? You may go there first, and he says, if you realize the emptiness of your own mind, then quite easily you realize the emptiness of all objects of the mind. They were all like dominoes falling. Realize the emptiness of mind, you'll quickly realize the emptiness of all other phenomena. It's a more direct route. This is the route that Atisha is teaching here. He's going right to the nature of mind. Realize emptiness of mind, realize the nature of unborn realize the natural liberation, the natural freedom of this ground state of awareness, Rikpa itself. And then when you come out of meditation, you're returning back to engaging with the world around you. He says, now act as if you were an illusory being, as if you were already dead and in the bardo. Act as if you were a mirage. Act as if you were an illusion and engage with the world from that, from that perspective. So now I'll slowly wrap this up. We have more points, but I wanted to show you what is unique. Peaceful means. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good. Good, good. Very good. Very skillful means.
Good. All right. How do we go from renunciation and shamatha and then realization of emptiness, especially the emptiness of the mind, and then by the power of that realizing the emptiness of all phenomena, and by realizing emptiness of all phenomena, realizing, seeing for oneself how all phenomena arise in this mode of dependent origination. How do we go from there to relative bodhicitta? Because we see he does it very directly and very swiftly. It's not an elaborate whole sequence of meditations. He goes directly to Tonglen. From ultimate bodhicitta, he goes directly to Tonglen, descending and receiving, sending and receiving. I think it's very smooth. Because if you realize the emptiness of your own inherent nature, of your own identity, the emptiness of inherent nature of your own mind, then you know any distinction between self and other must also be empty, must also be an illusion. And as you attend to another person, you know this person, like myself, must be empty of inherent nature. This person's mind must be inherent, empty of inherent nature, which means where is the real barrier, where is the real division? between my mind and your mind, between me and you. Where is that division between my side and your side, between subject and object? Where is the division? And you see, it's merely nominal. It's just a word. It's like a border between Amer United States and Canada. Where is it? Well, we all agreed. What is it? The 48th parallel. We agreed, but it's just an agreement. It's nothing more than something we just project. And we agree, okay, that's your side, that's my side. But you look, where's the line? Where's the line? That's just in your imagination. Nowhere else. It's just your imagination we agree upon. Right? So likewise between the United States and Canada, the United States and Mexico, it's just a line that we agree upon or don't, but it's not there. Nobody in his right mind thinks, oh, I just, I just discovered the border between Mexico. I just found it. Look, there it is. It's a little line in the sand. Not there. But as that's true for borders between countries, between hemispheres, where's the northern hemisphere? Where's the southern hemisphere? Likewise between subject and object, between I and thou. It's an imaginary line. And so Shantideva, with this incredible poignancy, as he's grappling with the issue, can I take upon myself the responsibility? Again, Geshe Lao was speaking of, speaking of this this morning. When we attend to the suffering of our mother sentient beings, of our family, our extended family, human beings, animals, and all sentient beings, as we consider the, the challenge, can I take upon myself the responsibility I shall liberate all sentient beings. Take seriously, take to heart, for as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, so long shall I remain to alleviate the suffering of the world. And Shantideva is grappling with that because he knows there's an easier way, a shorter way. And that is, I'm going to practice ethics, samadhi, and wisdom. I'm going to get out. I'm going to go to a state of immutable bliss and never suffer ever, ever again. Or I can stay here for three countless eons following the Bodhisattva way of life, boy, that looks awfully attractive. You know, and he's looking at this, and he raises this question. It's a soliloquy. He's inviting it into his mind in this eighth chapter. This eighth chapter, the chapter on meditation, which is a chapter on cultivating bodhicitta as a method for developing shamatha. And he raises this question. I mean, feel the drama if you can. I mean, it really comes to my heart. He says, do I really need to take on the responsibility of other suffering? And he has some sense of magnitude of that. He has some sense. We're talking about all sentient beings here. Do I need, is it necessary for me to take on myself the responsibility of liberating all sentient beings? Because I kind of get it. This is awesome. This staggers the mind. The responsibility here. Is that necessary? He's calling to himself. Is it necessary? And then the answer comes back. Yes, it is. And they question, why? Why do I need to take on that responsibility? It's, it's awesome. It's terrifying, maybe. Why? And the answer comes back. Because suffering has no owner. Now that goes to my heart like a spear. Suffering has no owner. It's not out there. It's not in some other place. If any sentient being is suffering, that suffering is your suffering. We are all existing in fundamental, existential, essential interdependence. So just like a loving father and mother, if they see any of their children suffering, they'll never say, but oh, that's a child's problem. I'm not suffering. I'm so happy. 
my child's suffering, but that's not my problem. No parent ever thinks that. No loving parent ever thinks that. Or a loving spousal relationship. Oh, I guess my wife is really sick, but you know, that's the breaks. Every people get sick, but I'm having a really good day myself. Nobody thinks that. Not in a healthy marriage or in a friendship. Never happens. Their suffering is your suffering. And Shantideva is now seeing, all right, the whole world is your family. And so why must I take on responsibility? Because suffering has no owner. It doesn't belong to someone else. There's no barrier. There's no demarcation between my suffering and your suffering. And therefore, it's the only rational thing to do. That's where the teachings of emptiness come in. If you really, if you have that background of an authentic motivation of renunciation, you have your shamatha, you have your vipassana. If you've seen that, then you see, and you see because of pratita samutpata, because of a dependent origination, the very notion of now, I'm going to leave all of you behind and I'm going to head off for my own liberation. They said, what, are you crazy? What part didn't you understand? If you really understand, you don't even have any independent existence of your own. What are you thinking about achieving liberation independently when you don't even exist independently? And therefore, the only sensible thing to do is to develop great compassion, maha karuna. Develop bodhicitta. It's the only sensible thing. It's the only option only option. So later on when you go to Saranath, we'll talk a little bit about free will. In Buddhism we speak of Rangwa Mepe Nyingje, compassion that is helpless. Helpless compassion. Compassion with no freedom. And that is if a mother sees her child suffering, she doesn't choose, well, shall I feel empathy today or not? Shall I want to rescue my child from suffering or not? Let's see, let, let's make a decision. She has no choice. The loving mother has no choice. Because the connection is too strong. My child's suffering is my suffering. If I'm suffering, of course I want to alleviate it. It's not a matter of choice. Of course, I take care of it. And likewise, my children. And likewise, my whole family. And so I love this. That is, we enter into the Bodhisattva way of life. And the further we proceed on that Bodhisattva path, the less and less freedom we have. The greater and greater freedom we have, to make wise choices that are conducive to our own and others' well-being. Greater, greater freedom. The more our minds are dominated by mental afflictions, whether we're rich or poor, powerful or weak, prestigious or having no, pres no prestige at all, the more the mind is dominated by mental affliction, we have very little freedom to make wise choices. Because our mental afflictions will make the choices for us, like somebody else driving your car. The more free we are of mental afflictions, the more free we are to make wise decisions. And that's the only kind of freedom that matters. Making wise decisions. Having the freedom to make a wise decision and carry through with it. For that you want shamatha. You want vipassana. You want bodhicitta. So it's wonderful. On the one hand. On the other hand, the more deeply you cultivate compassion and bodhicitta, the less freedom you have. And so by the time you become a Buddha, then you have no freedom at all. Because you are so utterly, absolutely, and forever committed to alleviating the suffering of all sentient beings for as long as space remains, that if there's any suffering remaining in the world, you have no choice. As a Buddha, yet you have a very strong job description. And you have no choice. You can't say, oh no, I want to have take a vacation from being Buddha for one day. Give me a break. I want to relax a little bit. So sorry. Buddhas have no vacation. You know, No freedom to choose not to be Buddha. No freedom to have a little bit less compassion today. No freedom at all. Glorious lack of freedom. Helpless compassion. Magnificent helpless compassion. And so that's where, Shant well, that's where Atisha, the great Atisha who combined the wisdom of Nagarjuna with the skillful means of Asanga and flowed these, integrated these into one integrated system. The Majamaka together with the, the, the Bodhicitta teachings, the Bodhisattva teachings of Asanga coming by way through from Maitreya. And so the teachings of Manjushri coming through, through Nagarjuna, the teaching of perfection of wisdom of Majamaka, the teachings of Maitreya on skillful means coming through Asanga, and these are unified, synthesized in this magnificent teaching of Atisha that he lays out on the Lamrim, but for those who are willing to follow the steep route up the face of the mountain, then we have this seven point mind training. So you go directly from realization of emptiness, the realization of the dreamlike nature of reality, the realization of yourself as being an illusory being with no core, no essence. You're not intrinsically even a sentient being. You're empty of being a sentient being. It's only a convention. 
is a conceptual designation. Going directly from there to Donglen, attending to the suffering of any other and taking it upon yourself, attending to any other and offering them the best you have, your virtue, your goods, your virtue, everything you offer and everyone you attend to, you're breathing and you're breathing out. You're linking the Donglen practice, your restoration itself. Practicing Donglen even with regards to yourself. Taking upon the suffering that you'll experience in the future. Let it ripen now. And offering the joy that you have, offering this to others. And so he goes directly from teachings on emptiness, ultimate bodhicitta, to, to very simple teachings on bodhicitta. Very simple. Donglen. But that'll take you all the way. With that kind of background, the renunciation, the shamatha, the vipassana, the realization of emptiness of mind, you don't need now an elaborate approach to developing bodhicitta. Donglen will take you all the way so that it becomes spontaneous and you see anyone suffering and you actually long, oh, might that ripen on me? It would make me so happy if that ripens on me. And whatever, whatever joys, bounties, possessions and so forth, virtues and merit, oh, I'm so happy to give away. So happy, release without attachment. Because it's your joy to give it away. You know? So that's how he goes to ultimate and relative bodhicitta. And the rest of the seven point mind training is just to, how do you say, to nurture that. To nurture that, to synthesize, to let the whole focus of your entire practice be on the cultivation of ultimate and relative bodhicitta. It's single-minded, single, single pointed focus. There's the essence, never waver, never, never stray, never, be, never forget, never be distracted. This is the core of all of Mahayana Dharma. This is the core of the path to enlightenment. And so there, the stages, three, steps three, four, five, is all about that. Focus, focus, focus. Here, self-cherishing is the root of all suffering. Self-grasping, the root of all suffering. Know who your real enemies are. Know who your real friends are. It's cultivation of ultimate valid bodhicitta. Dharma gets very simple. Dharma can be enormously elaborate. You can study it for 30 years and have only a teaspoon from the ocean of Buddha Dharma. But it can also be very simple. Let your whole practice be ultimate and relative bodhicitta. And you're always on the straight track to enlightenment. And then the final two, the final two points out of seven are really all about cultivating a way of life that protects your cultivation of ultimate and relative bodhicitta. It's advice. Avoid this type of behavior. Engage in this type of behavior. It's like with monastic vows. Like, it's like with monastic vows. If you become a monk, if you become a monk with the aspiration to achieve liberation, to practice ethics, samadhi, and wisdom, what do you have all those precepts for? Fully ordained monk, 253 precepts. Novice monk, 36 precepts. What are those all for? What are all those rules and regulations, those precepts, those vows for? To protect you. To protect you. Your practice of ethics, samadhi, and wisdom is like your garden. This is what will take you to the, the fruition of enlightenment, of liberation and enlightenment. But you need protection. So your ethics, your vows are like the rabbit fence. It's the fence around your garden so the, the, the other animals don't keep, come in and eat up all your, 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 your garden, your fruits and vegetables. And so ethics, all the precepts, all the advices on conduct, all to protect us, our practice so that it doesn't get eroded, uh, eroded and, and stealed away, or robbed away by misconduct. So that's the whole of the seven point mind training. It's quite interesting, ethics comes at the end. And right towards the beginning, after the preliminaries comes immediately, perfection of wisdom. So we see this is a very steep path, but it's a magnificent path. And I received this 40 years ago, I've taught it many times, and what I find remarkable, and this is where we'll end, what I find remarkable, having taught this again and again over the last 40 years, how many people who are very fresh to Dharma, who have very little f faith or knowledge, are introduced, and Bobby is a wonderful example of this. I think when you first came, you said this is your first book, Commentary Seven Point Mind Training, hardly any background. But there are people in this world right now, in this contemporary world, with little or no understanding of Buddha Dharma, and I've seen this again and again, they're introduced to the Seven Point Mind Training, and it just speaks right to the heart. Whatever their worldview, their beliefs, their occupation, they're wealthy, they're poor, they're powerful, they're weak, whatever they are, it goes right to the heart. And that becomes your home. And then you receive more teaching. And what I found is like, I've, I've been to, especially in train stations in India, sometimes you get one of those plates that has little compartments. Here's compartment for dal, here's compartment for the sapji, here's for the rice. 
that everything has a place, right? And so this seven point mind training, it's like a plate with seven categories. And what I have found, I'm not a great scholar, but I've received many teachings, is that whatever the teaching is, whether it's Vajrayana, whether it's Theravada, it's Pali Canon, it's Mahayana, stage regeneration, whatever it is, I found the seven point mind training is a tray when there's always a place for it already you find it a place to put it in the seven in any of the seven points so it's a context a holder i would suggest now you see whether it's true but whatever teachings we receive from buddha dharma whether from the shravakayana the pali canon mahayana vajrayana whatever you see see whether it doesn't fit in the seven point mind training and then you see aha now i have a framework in which all the teachings fit they all have a place, and you see how they all interrelate. So this is really magnificent. If you're going to start with one teaching, I don't think you can do better than the seven-point mind training. The long run is fantastic, but this is complementary. And what I found for people like ourselves, many of us being relatively well-educated, relatively intelligent, and looking for some really smart dharma, not just calling on faith and belief and obedience. There's nothing wrong with that. But for myself, I know that would not have been enough. Give me something smart. Give me something intelligent that is fully contemporary and absolutely authentic to the Buddhist teachings. And that's what a teacher gives us here, the seven-point mind training. So there are many Tibetan lamas, Westerner and Asian, Tibetan, Nepalese, Mongolian, and so on, who have this lineage. It's not hard to find. But if this gives you some inspiration to go deeper into this teaching, I say the door is open. And it truly is a magnificent teaching. So I have published many books, but two books on seven-point mind training. Just out of my deep admiration, my deep faith, and so deep faith in Atisha. He was like, if I have a background in science. We think of Galileo. He was the scientist. He did everything that you would hope for a scientist. He developed his technology. He was an experimenter. He made observations. He was a mathematician. He made hypotheses. He was the first scientist. He was everything you could ever want a scientist to be. And he started the science of revolution. I would say, anything you could ever, everything you would ever want a Mahayana teacher to be, a teacher was everything. He was the Bodhisattva, he was the great scholar, he was the great Siddha, he was a great translator, he was a great writer, he was a great debater, he was a great teacher. He had everything. If you're looking for a guru, don't look any further than Dhisha. He's the guru of gurus. He brought everything together of Nagarjuna and Asanga tracing back to the Buddha. So Namo 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 to Joatisha, the Lama of Lamas, and this is why he's revered in all schools of Tibetan Buddhism. They all adore him, no sectarianism. They all press palms. Oh Atisha. Such a great blessing to the people of Tibet. And now by way of Tibet to the whole world. So this is my all of that I've shared with you this afternoon is simply an expression of my reverence, my faith my love and devotion for Atisha and for his teaching. So, so let's just spend a, a couple of minutes in quiet. The seven point mind training says, Talk to Nila Jawanyi. In the beginning and end, there are two things to do. Beginning we've already done, and that is motivation. Right? Motivation. And the end is dedication. So this day comes to a close. There's been wonderful virtue today. We've come to this holy place, the most sublime place on the planet for we who are following the teachings of the Buddha. We've had wonderful teachings from geshe -la, wonderful Dharma practitioners all around us, great blessing here. I would say with great confidence, there's been a lot of virtue today, of listening, of practicing, of teaching, a lot of virtue. But now, where should we direct it? How should we direct it? That is what dedication of merit is for. So again, in silence, we have a lot of noise around us, that's good. But in our own minds, now I invite you individually, dedicate whatever merit, virtue, goodness there is from today's practice, of your own practice, to the realization of your most meaningful aspirations for yourself, for the world, for the short term and the long term. So let's spend just a couple of minutes in quiet. Oh, it's okay.
And I'll conclude with one quintessential dedication, and that is Gewadi Nyoduta. By the merit of this, may I swiftly, Sange Gopan Dupkyone, may I achieve the state of Buddhahood, Doa Chikya Malupa, Te Sala Gopasho, and may I guide, may I lead every single individual without exception to that state of enlightenment. So, concluding prayer. So thank you for the opportunity to share Dharma. It's the greatest gift you give and the greatest gift to receive. So thank you all. Got a front row seat. <laughs> <laughs>